Good evening, everyone. My name is Michael Anderson, and I'm the president and CEO of the Oklahoma City Museum of Art. And I would like to welcome you to the first James C. Mead lecture of 2022, Landscape Unmoored, Painting Along Shore in Modern America, presented by Dr. Kamiya Shahi. First, we would like to uh, extend our sincerest thanks to the entire Mead, Mead family, uh, beginning with Virginia Mead, and of course, to all of our other donors and sponsors who make this lecture series possible. Uh, a few program notes before I uh, introduce our speaker. First, please note that this program is being recorded. And second, following the lecture, our speaker welcomes questions. Please post your questions or comments in the Q&A function. The button is located at the top right corner of your screen. So feel free to post those questions at any time throughout the lecture, and they will be read aloud by staff during the Q&A portion of our program. And now on to our speaker. Kamiya Shahi is Assistant Professor in the Department of Art History at the University of Southern California. She researches, teaches, and writes about histories of landscape, geography, empire, and environment in modern American, excuse me, in modern and American art and culture. She is currently working on a book that examines how coastlines were pictured and mapped in the United States during the 19th century. Kamiya received her PhD from Princeton University and has held fellowships in the Center of uh, Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts, the Smithsonian American Art Museum, and the Winterthur Museum. At present, she is also a postdoctoral fellow at the Harvard University Center for the Environment, where she is researching art and U.S. environmentalism in the 1970s. Please help me welcome our very distinguished speaker, Dr. Kamiya Shahi. Hello, and thank you. Thank you, Michael, for that, that generous introduction. Good evening, everyone switch to my title slide. Before I get started, I want to extend my thanks both again to Michael Anderson for that lovely introduction, as well as to the Oklahoma City Museum of Art for inviting me to be part of the James C. Mead Friends Lecture Series. It is an honor and a privilege to be able to participate. Thank you also to Sarah Wise and Elizabeth Rowe for your expert logistical help as we navigated this um, virtual format. And I want especially to thank Brian Chambers for being such an expert liaison, especially amid our unexpected switch to a virtual format. I also want to thank the National Academy of Design and the American Federation of Arts um, for inviting me to contribute to For America paintings from the National Academy of Design. And lastly, and most importantly, thanks to all of you for being here. I wish it had been possible for me to join you in person, but I look forward to sharing this presentation with you over Zoom. So. Let's get into it. New Hampshire Coast by Kay Walking Stick is a painting of a landscape in motion. Waves heave, crash, and lap against a rocky shoreline, which reaches a curved arm toward the water as if to beckon it inward. Further out to sea, the water darkens and deepens, leading our eye towards a crisp horizon. The clouds up above are a study of the changeable North Atlantic sky hints of blue peeking out from behind heavy grays, here and there areas of pale orange illuminated by the glow of the sun. Kay Walking Stick is an Oklahoma-born artist and member of the Cherokee Nation. You'll find her painting, Volute Volupte, on view as part of For America, and I really hope you'll take the time to check out her work in person if you can. Walking Stick was inducted into the National Academy of Design in 2019 and has enjoyed an illustrious career as an artist and teacher. She has a reputation as a quintessential painter's painter, meaning that she's an artist deeply committed to technique, process, and materials. I was fortunate to talk to Walking Stick about her work recently, and she told me that while she'd long been attracted to the idea of painting the ocean, she had also been somewhat daunted by the challenge. Viewed from shore, the water's vast scale, subtle coloration, and constant motion make for complex and unwieldy artistic subject matter. To quote the writer and environmentalist Rachel Carson, the seashore is both a strange and beautiful place. All through the long history of Earth, it has been an area of unrest. For no two successive days is the shoreline precisely the same. Today, a little more land may belong to the sea, tomorrow a little less. Always, the edge of the sea remains an elusive and indefinable boundary. So to achieve this finished picture, Walking Stick had to look patiently and repeatedly at this elusive and ever-changing landscape, making sketches and taking photographs, 
remembering, painting, and repainting. I imagine the rhythm of her working process almost mirroring the ebb and flow of the tide itself. The edge of the sea will be the focus of my talk today. Following Walking Stick's example, and we'll return to her work, I'm going to examine how a selection of artists' encounters with the shoreline and the impact it had on their work might lead us towards new insights into the interwoven histories of American painting and the American landscape. This is a big and complex topic. Like the shoreline itself, it might direct us to look in many different directions to discern an array of shifting pictures in what might ostensibly be a single view. While I'll attempt to, to cover a good deal of terrain today, the shape of my presentation is guided by the exhibition For America, Paintings from the National Academy of Design, which is on view at the Oklahoma City Museum until January 30th. For America surveys a selection of paintings that artists elected to become National Academy members have contributed to the Academy's collection since it was founded in 1825. Seeing this group of paintings displayed together presents us with one way of thinking about what it has meant to make American art and to be an American artist, and how these concepts have evolved over 200 years of history. So over the next 45 or so minutes, we'll explore what we can learn about this history from the perspective of the shore. What has it meant to picture America over time? In the early decades of the United States, landscape painting became one powerful means not only of seeing America, but of defining it as a nation. By the mid 19th century, it was possible for an art critic to state that landscape painting was, and I quote, the thoroughly American branch of painting, surpassing all others in popular favor. What comes to mind when you think of a landscape painting? On a basic level, we probably envision a picture like this. It provides us with a certain point of view, it conveys the visual characteristics of a place or a scene, and it draws our eye in and through an imaginary space by creating a believable sense of dimension and distance. Kay Walkingstick has described landscape paintings as depictions of nature reorganized by an artist. This definition reminds us that a landscape painting, even if based on a real life place or scene, is always also an act of translation, of mediation, through which the three-dimensional world is represented, reorganized, via pigments applied to a surface. Indeed, when the word landscape first entered English from Dutch in the 16th century, it did so as a term used by painters to describe a picture of land. Art and aesthetics are therefore, therefore central to how we should understand the idea of landscape. At the same time, we should not forget that the European roots of the word land also encompass social and political concepts like territory, region, and property, you might think of the words of the nation, the names of the nations, England or Scotland, for instance. As the cultural geographer Dennis Cosgrove has written, landscape might best be understood as a way of seeing, one that is both deeply connected to ideas about art and beauty, but which can also work ideologically in the ways that it visually orders and organizes nature, land, and territory. Landscape painting became a powerful way of organizing the very stuff of a new national geography in the early 19th century United States. It also became central to a vision for what a national school of art could be and the political and cultural values it could convey. And this was thanks largely to the efforts of the artists who founded the National Academy of Design in 1825. The, the Academy founders project was a nationalist one. They wanted to establish an institution for the development and promotion of American art on national soil. Accordingly, National Academy co-founder Asher Durand urged aspiring landscape painters to base their work as closely as possible on local scenery to develop a distinctly American visual idiom. He argued, and I quote, why should not the American landscape painter, in accordance with the principle of self-government, boldly originate a high and independent style based on his native resources. Thomas Cole, a fellow landscape painter and co-founder of the National Academy, argued similarly that America's natural scenery was what distinguished it most from Europe. In an influential article titled Essay on American Scenery, Cole wrote that the unique beauty of American scenery lay in what he called its wildness. 
wildness being the word that he and fellow European Americans used to describe the relative absence of the kinds of agriculture and settlement that had defined how Europeans had long altered the landscapes they inhabited. These ideas about wildness owed much to the influence of Romanticism, a movement originating in European art, music, and literature, whose adherents prized the feelings of awe, beauty, and spirituality they thought they could find by shedding the constraints of society and searching out deeper, more universal truths and experiences. Many artists who were sympathetic to romantic ideals felt that they could attain these truths and experiences through direct encounter with capital N nature. And by nature, they often meant the world beyond farms, fences, and cities. So think of forests, rugged mountains, dramatic clouds, placid lakes, all of which we can see in this is painting by Cole in some form. This romantic idea of nature was, of course, just that, an idea. But in the work of landscape painters like Durand, Cole, and their followers, it became a defining feature of America's unique, uniqueness and values as a new nation. This is one of Cole's most famous landscape paintings, known as the Oxbow, which he completed the same year he published the essay on American scenery. In the foreground on the left, dark storm clouds barrage rugged forested hilltops filled with blasted tree trunks and rocky crags. As our eyes pass over the scene, the stormy wilderness subsides, giving way to a more placid scene of rolling hills and cultivated fields that hug the curve of the Connecticut River and stretch out on the right into the sunny distance. Cole's composition is a catalog of the American scenery the artist celebrated in his essay. Forests, mountains, expressive skies, a waterway. More than represent this scenery, though, Cole's picture also invites the viewer to read the landscape as a kind of narrative, a passage from wilderness to domestication that serves as an allegory for the future of the nation. In his essay, he wrote, seated on a pleasant knoll, look down into the bosom of that secluded valley, begin with wooded hills, through these enameled meadows and wide waving fields of grain, a silver stream winds lingeringly along. And looking out over the yet uncultivated scene, the mind's eye may see far into futurity. Where the wolf roams, the plow shall glisten. Mighty deeds shall be done in the now pathless wilderness. Yet Cole also expressed ambivalence about this possible future, writing, quote, I cannot but express my sorrow that the beauty of such landscapes are quickly passing away. The ravages of the ax are daily increasing. And looking at this picture, we might detect this ambivalence in its composition. Is the storm indeed passing out of view, or does it threaten to engulf the sunlit valley? Is this a picture of promise as well as a vision of loss? Cole's abiding belief in landscape's power to convey these possibilities is evident in his inclusion of a self-portrait near the center of the composition. The unfinished canvas he's working on bridges the divide between the two halves of the composition. Indeed, perhaps it even symbolizes America itself as an unfinished picture. So by looking at this picture in its historical context, we can understand how Cole's vision of the American landscape is not a neutral one. Rather, the ideas about nature and nationhood this painting seeks to bind together support a set of specific claims to nature and to the land itself that align with the processes of colonialism and territorial expansion that were unfolding during this era. Northampton, Massachusetts, the location of this painting, belongs in the traditional homelands of the Pocumtuck and Nipmuc people, but this fact is not acknowledged in this image. So in other words, it arranges our relationship to the land from a very specific point of view. So thus far, we've discussed how in the early decades of our national history, landscape painting became a particularly powerful way of seeing America. As we trace in For America, founding members of the National Academy of Design played a particularly important role in promoting landscape painting as a national school. We've also noted how by examining its roots and etymology, the idea of landscape originated as a way of describing a kind of picture, particularly one composed of land, that is, terrains that could be inhabited, shaped, and organized in certain ways. However, during the middle decades of the 19th century, a growing number of landscape painters began turning their attention in a new direction, towards the ocean shore. National Academy member John Frederick Kensett had largely painted inland landscapes like the one on the left, but by the 1850s, seacoasts increasingly drew his attention. 
The results were paintings such as the one on the right, which consists of a rocky beach, water, and a flat wide horizon line beneath a vaulted sky. These elements structure a composition that appears deceptively simple, even verging on vacant compared to the dense woods and rocky waterfall in the painting at left. Kensent wasn't alone in turning to the shore during this period. This was a time of growing interest in shorelines across artistic, literary, scientific, and entrepreneurial spheres. Poets and writers frequently explored the shoreline's potential as a site of aesthetic experience. Many, including figures like Walt Whitman and Emily Dickinson, as well as the transcendentalist thinkers Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau, discerned moral, spiritual, or metaphysical significance in the ocean's wildness, its sense of infinite space, its awe-inspiring sound and motion. In a letter I found in Kenseth's archive, fellow landscape painter Benjamin Champney expressed some frustration with his friend's new interests and their impact on his work. In the letter, Champney urges Kensett to, I quote, leave those odd rocks and waterscapes. I know you will come back to the stern mountains with pleasure after getting tired of the monotony of old ocean. I'm particularly fascinated by Champney's use of the made up word waterscape because it suggests that Kensett's focus on water produced a kind of picture a way of artistically reorganizing nature that was fundamentally different from his inland subjects. So different, in fact, that the word landscape failed to adequately describe it. And I'll just note here that the term seascape might come to mind when you look at pictures like this. But what's interesting is that seascape was also an invented word. It began to emerge in England only in the 1840s, and it didn't really gain traction in the United States until later in the 19th century. So this is a moment when the vocabulary used to talk about images like this was still very much in formation. So what did it mean to picture the world of the shore in 19th century America? To shift an orientation from landscape to waterscape? After Kensett died in 1872, the National Academy held a memorial exhibition and sale of his work that was found in his studio. We can recognize a number of coastal scenes on display interspersed with his landscapes. And we can certainly notice a degree of sameness among these pictures, a sense that the artist is interested in only the subtlest details that differentiated the various locales he liked to paint along the East Coast. But the similarities among Kensett's waterscapes are also revealing. By foregrounding the forms and effects that appear to repeat along many different coastlines, it strikes me that they capture something more general, even abstract, about the nature of coasts and the kinds of looking they invite. While Cole's picture is crammed full of details that lead our eye into and through the landscape, aligning with how the space expresses narrative possibility and the passage of time, as I discussed, Kensett leads our gaze from precisely rendered topography along the coast towards a much more undifferentiated space. There's nothing specific to anchor our eye. The horizon line is barely even perceptible. Compared to the sense of motion that gives Cole's landscape its sense of time and legibility, in Kensett's, there's a palpable sense that time has slowed or perhaps opened up as if the horizon extends infinitely beyond the edge of the canvas. Art historians have found evidence that Kensett often adjusted his compositions to include more of the ocean than could actually be seen on the spot. He also modified the shape and position of the topography along the shore to create a greater sense of distance and depth. By emphasizing the vast and indefinite qualities of the view from shore, Kensett's compositions resonate with the ideas set forth by the writers and thinkers I mentioned previously suggesting a shared interest in the ocean's capacity to produce ideas and, and impressions that extended and perhaps brought the viewer beyond the realm of the visible. These qualities, however, the same things that made the shoreline so aesthetically appealing to 19th century artists and writers, also made it a particularly elusive and challenging subject for painters. According to the British critic John Ruskin, whose work was very influential in the United States, Moving water was nearly impossible to paint truthfully. Ruskin likened it in difficulty to trying to paint a soul, which I thought was a particularly uh, wonderful and interesting turn of phrase. The artist William Trost Richards was a landscape painter and watercolorist who, like Kensett, 
became increasingly interested in painting coasts and water around mid-century. But whereas Kensett's work embraced the vague and indefinite qualities of the ocean, Richards dedicated himself to the challenge of truthfully depicting breaking waves in all their complexity. And I can, I'm showing you here a particularly diagrammatic drawing of his where he's really studying the movements of ocean waves. Like many of his peers, Riskin, um, sorry, Richard strove to emulate Ruskin's advice that landscape painters should study the natural world in the manner of scientists, striving to capture the truths of nature in their work. Richards was also interested in geology, and it's possible that this interest informed his attraction to coasts, since they were understood as terrains where it was possible to observe and study water in action as a geological force, seeing it in real time as it eroded coastal rocks deposited new layers of sediment, pulverizing the sand. Richard's coastal paintings won praise for their exhaustive detail and accuracy. Critics even likened them to scientific studies. But in letters to family and friends, Richards expressed persistent doubts about his ability to capture moving water truthfully. He wrote, I watch and watch it, try to disentangle its push and leap and recoil, get soaked with spray, and this happens 20 times in an hour. Richards was so dedicated to this struggle that he actually literally immersed himself in his subject matter. His probably very embarrassed son tells a story of Richards standing for hours in a bathing suit among the waves, trying to analyze the motion of water until people thought him insane. Over time, this deep engagement with his subject matter led Richards to begin taking a more experimental approach to how he used water itself as an artistic medium. His works in watercolor grew bigger and bolder, and he started using a type of bumpy paper, typically used as carpet liner, which allowed him to let his pigment soak and run, becoming visibly looser and wetter. So on our screens, this image might look pixelated or like it's a, a lower resolution, but that's actually the qualities of the paper and the paint and how Richards was, was experimenting. In this case, he began to let water flood his pictures just as he'd immersed himself in the waves. And in these details here, you can see how water and pigment saturated areas of his composition. And in, others, in other areas, the artist actually leaves the paper surface more exposed, allowing us to see its resemblance to the rocks he pictures. So while this picture overall might look pretty polished to us, watercolors like this appeared shockingly unfinished to the art critics of the time, who compared them with the minute details of Richard's earlier work. Richard's, on the other hand, wrote that experiments like these allowed him to know and see a great deal more than he ever had. This may have been because his process of applying water to paper began to resemble the processes by which water shaped the geology of the coast itself his pictures beginning to mirror the coast, not only in visual appearance, but also on a deeper level, the level of structure, texture, and materiality. So thus far, we've been looking at shorelines that are pretty much devoid of human figures and activity. However, 19th century painters examined coastal landscapes through these lenses as well. Like his contemporaries, Kensett and Richards, Edward Mitchell Bannister was a landscape painter drawn to coastal subjects. However, Bannister was much more interested in picturing the forms of labor and leisure that occurred along shore. He turned his attention to activities such as fishing, harvesting seaweed, agriculture, and sailing, treating the coastal landscapes in which these activities occurred as more than mere backgrounds. Born in Canada, Bannister moved to the United States in the 1850s becoming active in the abolitionist movement and eventually forging a career as one of the period's very few recognized black painters, a fact that reflects the entrenched racial inequalities he and so many others faced in that era. Bannister's artistic interest in the shore was probably most directly informed by his experience as a sailor. He had worked professionally on, on ships before emigrating to America, and after settling in Providence, Rhode Island in the late 1860s and finding success as an artist, Bannister purchased his own yacht and spent the summer sailing and making studies for future paintings. In works like these, we can see how closely Bannister was attuned to the atmosphere, tides, and weather. He renders the coast as a landscape in motion with his fluid brushstrokes. And this is perhaps in keeping with how he experienced this terrain as a navigator. Deeply religious, 
Bannister believed that nature was imbued with a spiritual significance. And with his painterly expressive brushwork, brushwork, excuse me, his paintings indeed capture a sense of the unity and emotive force of the landscape. At the same time, they also visualize 19th century coastlines as complex saltwater terrains, whose shifting grounds were animated by the push-pull between large-scale natural forces and various forms of human endeavor and meaning making. I'm particularly struck here by the small scale of the sailboat um, in relation to the landscape that kind of envelops and surrounds it. Like Bannister, Winslow Homer explored the seacoast interconnectedness with human work and experience. In early work as a newspaper illustrator during the mid-19th century, Homer frequently captured the changing social world of the American beach, as here, depicting a very playful crowd of summertime tourists in the waters off Newport, Rhode Island, which had by the 1850s become one of the nation's most popular seaside resorts. In 1881, Homer crossed the Atlantic and lived for two years in a small fishing village on the coast of England. There, he observed people whose work and lives were intimately connected with the sea. And he began in paintings like this to depict this intimacy in a newly forthright manner. Here, a woman holding her child braces against a gale, her gaze fixed on the burst of a breaking wave on the far left. Homer conveys the woman's solidity and strength in her posture and silhouette, but he also juxtaposes her against the stormy water in a way that conveys its power. I'm struck by the way the woman and the water seem to face off, almost as if mirroring each other in a charged confrontation. Her braced forearm parallels the horizon, but sits slightly above it, almost as if she's straining to keep the rising waters at bay. These themes of human struggle against the power and dominance of the ocean would preoccupy Homer for the rest of his painting career, leading to some of his most well-known works. Here, he foregrounds the danger faced by those who labor on or in the sea. Note how they're nearly overcome by walls of water and how Homer positions us as the viewers at an even lower point of view, as if we too might be immersed or enveloped by the ocean. By the late stage of his career, Homer had completely eliminated figures from his coastal paintings. Filling canvases only with the water, rocks, and sky he observed on the coast of Prout's Neck, Maine, where he lived. The only human presence that now confronts these forces is the painter's own, represented not as a figure within the landscape, but through a face-off with the elements that unfolds within the medium of paint on canvas. Scholars have suggested Homer's intention in paintings like this to draw his viewers not merely into the landscape, but specifically into his experience of painting it over time. So we can think about how Homer puts us in his shoes. He wants us to feel as if we're seeing what he sees, holding his brush, grappling with the same forces and effects he grapples with. In this respect, Homer's paintings recall Richard's earlier watercolor experiments, and that they ask us to consider the similarities between water and paint rendering the power and agency of both materials with a new sense of monumentality. Muscular embodied confrontations between an artist and the natural forces around him, Homer's coastal paintings allow us to see the similarities between the act of making a painting, layering wet atop dry, building up material and scraping it away, and the processes of saturation, sedimentation, and erosion that constantly make and remake shoreline terrains. Homer's monumental painterly confrontations with coastal forces had a profound influence on a subsequent generation of artists. One of these was Robert Henry, an artist and fellow member of the National Academy who became an influential and charismatic teacher to well-known students like John Sloan, Rockwell Kent, Edward Hopper, and George Bellows. Henry encouraged his students to portray the realities of everyday life and experience in their paintings. Modern painting, he argued, should not merely serve as a means of recording these realities, but rather could serve as a means of recreating them by conveying not just what an artist observed, but also how they felt, what they thought, capturing a sense of mood, atmosphere, texture, and the passage of time, as Henry I does in one of my favorite works of his, which is a street view of New York in the winter. Homer's late paintings of the Maine coast 
informed Henry's ideas about what it meant to make landscape paintings according to these principles. He sought out similarly rugged subject matter for his own work on visits to Monhegan Island, a rocky island off the coast of Maine, where he began making trips in 1903. In studies like these, the dynamism of Henry's big wet-on-wet -wet brushstrokes is particularly striking, evidence of the artist's efforts to capture the surf's churning tension and powerful rhythm by mirroring them with his gestures in paint, in a way that I think even develops and exaggerates what Homer was doing. Henry encouraged his students to follow his lead and head to the coast. I quote, grasp the big things outdoors, the immense power of the sea, the rock standing there. We do not think of the rock, but of resistance. By emulating the vigorousness of Homer's late work, Henry also felt that artists could make work that embodied an authentically American outlook. I quote him again, it is personal greatness and personal freedom, which any nation demands for a final right art expression. Henry envisioned the vanguard of American artists as a group of men and women who were capable of capturing nature as a living thing on canvas. In this way, Henry's ideals of artistic freedom and patriotic vigor would materialize in paint. Quote, the big strong thing can only be the result of big strong seeing. Two of Henry's students who sought to emulate his example were George Bellows and Rockwell Kent who both traveled to Monhegan Island in the first decade of the 20th century. I think you can immediately see how the three artists approached the same landscape in similar ways. The similarities between Bellows and Henry's handling of paint are perhaps most apparent. And this is unsurprising given that the, given that the two visited Monhegan and worked side by side making outdoor studies when Bellows first visited the island in 1911. Thereafter, Bellows adopted Henry's mode of making rapid painted sketches on the spot. And here I compare one of Henry's small oils from the summer of 1911 on the right with one Bellows completed during his second visit to Monhegan Island in 1913. These studies reveal both artists shared fascination with bringing the power of churning water into dialogue with the material viscosity of paint, elaborating Homer's approach from a few years earlier. In Three Rollers, which was Bellows' presentation when he joined the National Academy, we can see how he worked through Henry's ideas about landscape, painting, and experience, and ultimately made them his own. In this painting, the outer contours of the rocky coastline are delineated in weighty black paint against an inky sea and tumultuous sky. Uneven terrain stretches away from the foreground, undulating with the energy of thick brushstrokes that echoes the clouds above. Although the painting's title denotes the presence of rollers, which are definable as long, heavy waves, which roll in upon a coast as after a storm, the water here appears oddly calm and devoid of such waves. The only disruption in its otherwise smooth surface is a lone strip of horizontal white, the front edge of a cresting wave. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but I'm signaling it here. The three long bands of cloud above approximate the titular rollers much more closely than does this thin white line, which is easily the most delicate passage in the whole composition. Registered with the economy of a single brushstroke, the solitary wave configures three rollers as a landscape scaled not only to recognizable dictates of depth and perspective, but also to the instance of painterly gesture. Through this gesture, the painting preserves something of the spontaneity of Bellow's initial sketches made on the spot. In so doing, it gives form to Henry's assertion that a single stroke of paint was all that was needed to carry the observer into a painter's authentic perception and memories, what Henry called their emotional landscape. For Bellow's, however, crafting such a landscape entailed not just immediacy, but also a degree of distance, or what he called independence from his subject matter. Looking closely at three rollers in comparison to the study, we can observe that it departs from the study in many ways. We can see how Bellows reinforces the outline of the cliffs, for instance, and he shifts our point of view so that more of the water and sky are visible in the final composition on the left. The sky too looks like it was added from a different sketch than this one. These careful adjustments reflect Bellow's process of amalgamating different impressions and sketches into one final image. And in so doing, it resonates with the artist's idea that there was no meaningful distinction between the natural and the artificial. 
Fellows argued that artists should understand that their work did not merely imitate nature, but that it was like nature, never constant, always unfolding, responding, and changing. Like nature, a work of art, quote, may be described as an arrangement or ordering of forces, just as all acts of life are the reordering of phenomena and the search for a finer reordering. So like Homer and Henry, Bellow's encounters with the Maine coast helped him distill his ideas about the similarities between nature and painting. His colleague Rockwell Kent, on the other hand, oriented his practice towards a search for nature in the wider world. Following a first visit and extended stay on Monhegan Island, Kent, like the 19th century romantics before him, began seeking out inspiration, meaning, and what he called the ultimate in ever more wild and remote coastlines. In words that might recall those of Thomas Cole, Kent once declared that, quote, America offers nothing to the tourist but the wonders of its natural scenery. An avid writer and reader, as well as a printmaker, Kent was also a sailor, and as with Edward Mitchell Bannister, I don't think we should separate his coastal paintings from his experiences as a mariner. Kent's seafaring adventures took him to Newfoundland, Fox Island, Alaska, Tierra del Fuego, and Greenland, and he chronicled his voyages along many shores in texts, illustrations, and paintings. In images like this one from Alaska, which borrows the format of a traditional maritime chart, we can see how Kent's experiences as a seafaring traveler led him to develop his own way of seeing the landscapes of shore and sea from the perspective of a navigator, his eyes scanning the horizon or seeking the next safe harbor. I show you this detail because I especially love how his written description of the shoreline follows its contour. In this way, it leads our eye to almost coast along it as Kent may have done by boat. Kent's paintings of the islands and coastlines he visited distill their contours with a similar sense of almost cartographic precision. They chart his voyages and record the shorelines he discovered along the way, capturing, I think, his sense of possibility. And I quote, as the new coast unfolds itself, the imagination leaps into full vision. And I think we can see in all these images the way that, that he tries to capture this sense of possibility moving from, from shoreline to shoreline and understanding um, you know, the imagination and the experiences that could result. Like their maker, Kent's pictures traveled. Reproductions of two of his paintings of Monhegan Island, possibly the one I show you on the left, made their way to Hawaii, where a young art student named Reuben Tam encountered them. Tam immediately knew he had to visit the place that had inspired Kent's work, and eventually he made his way to Monhegan, where he and his wife Jerry would live on and off for decades. When Tan became a member of the National Academy much later in his career, he would submit this painting of Monhegan Island to the Academy's collection in place of a self-portrait. And I think this is a real testament to how much the island mattered to his practice, as well as his sense of self, and specifically his sense of self as an artist. Before he ever ventured to Maine, however, Tam forged his most formative relationships to landscape and to painting in his birthplace of Hawaii. In his autobiography, he wrote, growing up in Kauai gave me an abiding sense of place that was to chart my life as a landscape painter. Traversing the island's hilly shorelines, Tam described how he, quote, acquired a sense of geologic time, an awareness of land as dynamic presence, ephemeral entity, omnipotent, mystical, and beautiful. As an image like this one shows us, as well as these, which are his early paintings, what Tam described as the spirit of place was about exploring, even unearthing, both a personal and an elemental relationship to the island landscape and the waters that surrounded and shaped it. Tam's portrayals of Hawaii's coastal landscapes defied stereotypical images of exotic tropical island life. One critic described how they might even, quote, shock the American viewer Instead of the well-worn scene of hula dancers and guitar twangers and lay throwers, we are presented with starker and more unfamiliar aspects of Hawaii as a rocky island set in the midst of thundering seas. We might compare Tam's Hawaiian landscapes with the work of his slightly older contemporary, George O'Keefe, whose famous paintings of flowers, bones, and landscapes similarly united the close study of objects and places with an exploration of their expressive potential as abstract forms. 
O'Keefe, by then a well-known and successful artist, traveled to Hawaii in 1939 at the behest of the Hawaiian Pineapple Company, now known as Dole, which hired her to make images for their advertisements. It's clear, I think, from these works how much she was inspired by the scenery of, Hawaiian, of the Hawaiian Islands, particularly its coastlines. But we can also see how with their clean lines and bright colors, her paintings aligned with the exotic vision of Hawaii that, so, that sold so well to consumers and tourists. O'Keefe heard about Tam's work and visited him while she was in Hawaii. In a diary entry recounting the visit, Tam described how the two compared their different relationships to the islands, juxtaposing the quick impression of a tourist and the long study of a native. Tam felt that O'Keefe understood his feeling that, I quote, when we young island artists read in the papers that so-and-so has arrived in Honolulu and will paint Hawaii's beauty, we feel he has come to take something away from us. Ultimately, O'Keefe encouraged Tam and gave him advice he recorded in his diary. Quote, an artist must see the place as no one else in the world has seen it. No one has yet seen the American landscape, nor Hawaii. Perhaps you'll do it. This quest to see place and ultimately the American landscape from an utterly new perspective would define the rest of Tam's career. In his most memorable pictures, landforms, coastlines, islands, and water oscillate between the abstract and the recognizable. This push-pull between the visible and the elemental embodies Tam's slightly contradictory feeling that, in his words, the shores are universal and they are mine. The shore's duality as both an emotional landscape and a universal place expresses a tension Tam would explore throughout his career in and through the gestural and imagistic properties of paint, ink, and poetry. In this work, for instance, he uses the tactile qualities of paint to render geological and atmospheric forces that continually shape and reshape islands and coastlines. His purposeful brushwork, punctuated by hard edges, leads our eyes slowly around the island's rocky terrain. Though recognizable as a landscape, this image verges on abstraction as shifting slabs of gray, punctuated by fissures of brighter blue and white, evoke a sense of tectonic and temporal movement that gives dynamic presence to both the land and the night sky. Landscapes like these, Tam suggests in his work and his writing, are vested with an important kind of ambiguity. This might be Monhegan Island, as the title suggests, but we could see that this could just as easily be Kauai, two shorelines connected across vast oceanic distances, but united in the merging of paint on canvas. Tam was born Tam Bung Hoon, the son of Chinese parents who immigrated to Hawaii before he was born. This aspect of his personal history and geography informed his desire to situate his landscapes always in relation to what he called the vastness of oceanic space, distances that harbored other islands and other coastlines. Rather than define a national territory in the manner of the 19th century tradition, we might say that Tam's work purposefully declines to place the spectator decisively in a particular locale, as the critic Hilton Kramer wrote. In so doing, they create the impression that, quote, landscape has disappeared into painting. This act of disappearance, I think, is generative because it ultimately makes Tam's personal transoceanic geographies visible. In a sense, these paintings respond to O'Keeffe's provocative statement that no one has yet seen the American landscape by showing us how it might only become truly visible from a radically unmoored point of view, one that resonates with Tam's sense of self as both an islander and the descendant of, the descendant of those who crossed the Pacific to a new home. I want to close by returning to Kay Walking Stick now, whose work draws our story up to the present day. As with many of the artists we've looked at today, Walking Stick has long been interested in the challenge and possibility of painting at the threshold of land and sea. In these examples, the water's fluidity and flow become prime vehicles for the artist to explore a full range of painterly technique and gesture, from the richly layered greens and blues that follow the horizon furthest from shore, to the thicker, more agitated use of white to depict the texture of the, form and the foam and spray, and the strong directional brushstrokes that track the back and forth push and tug of the waves. 
In walking sticks hands, paint starts to look and act like water, while water becomes imbued with the expressive motility of, to quote the artist, this wonderful stuff we call paint. This kind of artistic alchemy has interested walking stick throughout her career. And in this example, part of a series of paintings of patterns on the surface of the Hudson River, her work prompts us to consider how both bodies of water and painted pictures share a capacity to reflect, refract, and transform the world around them, translating the lights and shadows that dance upon their surfaces into unexpected depths. In this painting, titled Montauk One, Walking Stick worked outdoors on Long Island, using her bare hands to build up something like 30 layers of paint and wax. Into these layers, she embedded pebbles and seashells that she found, giving the painting a tactile material relationship to the coastal landscape that, that inspired it. Cuts vertically in the face of the painting evoke the shape of the landscape. While this prominent horizontal line near center suggests the horizon line of the ocean seen from a distance. To my mind, these cuts also suggest the artist's interest in excavating beneath the surfaces of both the painting and the beach, as if unearthing buried geolog geological strata. The painting's structure and composition come to resemble the layered formation of the landscape itself in a way that might recall Richard's experiments. Just as its surface retains materials commonly found along a sandy beach. Even more directly than in Winslow Homer's work, we come to appreciate the beach as a kind of ground that accrues and absorbs different traces, layers, and marks over time, making it like the ground of a painting, the prepared surface that serves as the composition's foundation as it develops. Walking Six coastal paintings also help us see the American shoreline as a landscape that bears additional layers of historical, cultural, and political meaning. In this case, as a Cherokee artist, she reflects on the indigenous inhabitants of the Atlantic coast by overlaying a portion of her painting with a geometric pattern based on a woven basket of, N of Nantucket origin. You can see that in the lower, in the lower right. By incorporating indigenous, indigenous motifs into the landscape, Walking Stick prompts viewers of her work to consider America's past, present, and future as an indigenous place, and to reflect upon the continuing legacies of colonialism and territorial expansion that have displaced and dispowered indigenous people and nations. So here, the basket motif is a reminder of these histories of violence and loss, but it is also a reminder of how sacred the seacoast remains to the descendants of those who first lived fished and harvested in and along North America's saltwater margins. Images like this provide what Walking Stick calls vistas of memory, their purpose to quote, glorify our land and honor those people who first lived upon it. Walking Stick often composes her paintings over a pair of two canvases so that the vertical seam that bisects the two halves of the picture remains visible, as you can see here. And here's another example. This format is known as a, dic a diptych and it lends her landscape paintings a sense of duality that among its many effects reminds us of the American landscape's deepest contradictions. Here is beautiful scenery that is also contested and colonized terrain. These inconvenient truths sit side by side in Walking Stink's work. They ask us to appreciate what she terms our America the beautiful from more than one perspective. The shoreline is part of this story. As sites where foreign mariners first encountered North America's lands and inhabitants, coasts have loomed large in stale yet stubborn myths about the European discovery of the so-called New World and the beginnings of America. Walking Stick took on these myths in a 2001 essay about this painting on the left titled The Landing of Columbus, which was completed by the 19th century landscape painter Albert Bierstadt. In Bierstadt's picture, Christopher Columbus is shown arriving on the shore of the island, now known as San Salvador, where he landed in 1492. Columbus is bathed in bright light in the painting's midground, his arms raised in triumph like a glorified conqueror. In contrast, native people, shown mostly in shadow near the foreground, kneel and bow submissively. Walking Stick writes that she was both struck by the urge to laugh and moved to tears of anger at such a skewed portrayal of this historical event which had tragic outcomes for the native Taino people Columbus encountered, many of whom he captured, enslaved, or killed. Walking Stick notes that the Taino people in Bierstadt's paintings aren't even accurately represented, 
Bizarrely, Bierstadt has them wearing feathered war bonnets like those of the Sioux people of North America's Great Plains, thousands of miles away. Tellingly, Bierstadt had become famous for landscape paintings that glorified America's westward expansion in the 19th century. And interestingly, in the year that this was completed, the historian Frederick Jackson Turner famously proclaimed the closing of the frontier, essentially arguing that America had fulfilled its manifest destiny by becoming a nation that reached from Atlantic to Pacific, from sea to shining sea. So in an image like this one, we can also understand Walking Stick's assertion of indigenous presence in a coastal setting as a rebuttal, even a rewriting of inaccurate discovery narratives like Bierstadt's, one that reclaims the Atlantic shore by celebrating the beauty and survival of its indigenous inhabitants, cultures, and histories. Walking Stick has said, quote, I want to engage the viewer in that beauty. I also want them to see my primary message in the work. That is, this is our beloved land. No matter who walks here, no matter who owns it, this is our land. Recognize us and honor this land. So we might say that in pictures like this, landscape does not so much disappear into painting as emerge back out of it, back out of it, helping us to see old vistas through new eyes. I opened and closed with Walking Stick's work during this presentation because in her paintings, the seashore becomes not just multi-layered or elusive, but prismatic a place in motion that, through the act of painting, becomes capable of reflecting and refracting the American landscape's beauties and its contradictions. Inspired by her example, over the course of this presentation, I've explored the idea that a coastal perspective can prompt us to think differently, more expansively, less statically, and perhaps with a bit less certainty about what it means to picture the American landscape. What a coastal perspective means for different American painters varies greatly, as we've seen. But I've also tried to draw out some of the continuities among the many examples we've looked at to explore how the coast's layered grounds have had the capacity to get into paintings, impacting how they are made and how they make us see the world. Together, these artworks ask us to let the shore's shifting contours unmoor us from how we might usually think about the places, landscapes, and environment in which we live and move to see America itself as more elusive, but also from a more dynamic point of view. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Kamish Shahi. Please imagine the applause happening if we were in person, um, um, celebrating your presentation, your lecture. I, this is Brian Chambers from our imaginary sound booth. Um, I want to encourage all of our attendees to please take this time to post any questions you may have. Again, that Q&A section or function of um, Microsoft Teams is in the top right hand corner. It's two of those um, word bubbles with question marks inside them. Um, please feel free to type your questions now. Um, to kick things off, Camille, I, I wanted to explore a few things. Um, as staff, we have been texting back and forth during your lecture about some fun things. Um, I wanted to start with materials. Um, you touched on this briefly. Are there any media or any particular medium that lent itself to the subject matter of, of seascapes, of water, of any kind of material that you would say lent it to it? Thanks, Brian. That's a wonderful question. Obviously, for this presentation, I focused on painting. We looked mostly at oil painting, some acrylic paintings, and some watercolor. Um, and I tried to draw out some of the ways in which the materiality of paint as a kind of liquid, you know, lent artists, um, you know, opportunity to think about the qualities of water. I'm particularly interested myself in watercolor, in the, the sort of idea of what it means to paint something with it. <laughs> so to paint water with watercolor, I find that very intriguing, especially in relation to William Tross Richards' work. But of course, there were other mediums that artists have explored historically um, in terms of how to represent water. Um, photography is a particularly interesting case. Um, early it, sort of in, in photography's life, it was very difficult for photographers to capture motion and, and sort of like high contrast light. Um, and I wish I had a, a slide of his work, but there was a French photographer named Gustave Le Gray who became very well known in the 19th century for photographs of seascapes 
Um, and what he did is he actually, um, to make the photographs, he combined two negatives. He had to take two different images. So first he had to adjust to capture the sky, and then he had to readjust his camera to capture the water. And in each case, you know, he produced two images and only half of each image was really shown. So he then cut and paste and published the photographs as these composite images. I think that really helps um, reflect the idea of the shore as as elusive, not only to the eye, but to also these new technologies of, of you know, of re a representation that were emerging, such as photography. Um, but yeah, I kept it to painting just to, to keep some boundaries around this topic, which is so interesting otherwise. Thank you. Well, th that takes me to s something similar um, with photography and the overlapping negative that has a greater sense of motion, of movement, and a, and a medium, just to clarify, in that time period had long exposures. So any image would have been, had tracers or a ghost image. So in combining those two negatives, it achieved those that longer moments, moments in time. Um, can you talk, will you please talk more about the difference in whether it's subject matter, muse, artistic inspiration, or divine inspiration, mm -hmm. the, the particular differences between, say, a mountain, something more static, and the ever-changing and moving bodies of water. Thank you. Yes, that's that's great. Um, I mean, I my mind immediately always goes back to this quote by Ruskin that I that I mentioned that water is as difficult to paint as trying to paint a soul, which I think really captures this idea um, that artists really understood from you know from time immemorial that you know the the essential challenge of capturing something moving in a static image. There's just a fundamental, you know, act of translation um, and imagination that has to happen for that for that to take place. At the same time, there's a challenge embedded in that, which is, you know, this challenge of how to convey emotion in a static space. So um, so it's understood, I think, moving water as, as something ephemeral. The ocean as a kind of space was also understood as difficult. I mean, as Kay Walking Stick was even talking about with B like a week ago, you know, it's so big. And there's a sense that it is monotonous to return to the quote I mentioned of the landscape painter Benjamin Champney. He was, you know, a, a painter based in New Hampshire. Um, he loved the White Mountains. He's even associated with a kind of White Mountain school of painting. And he felt that mountains were stern, he called them, um, and, and, and sort of interesting. And by contrast, he, he talked about the ocean as, as, as monotonous, as undifferentiated. Um, and I think he expressed an idea shared by others in the period, and perhaps even today, that to stare out in the ocean is to sort of stare at nothing in, <laughs> in a certain sense. Um, that the eye could become fatigued or or even drawn towards you know um, ideas and impressions sort of beyond uh, beyond the, the the horizon, if you will. Thank you. Um, a reminder to our attendees: please feel free to post your questions, and we do have our first from the audience. This is from Peggy. We are fascinated with the work of Ruben Tam and his interactions with Georgia O'Keeffe. Can you speak more to her influence on his work? Yes, I am also fascinated by Ruben Tam. I think he's an artist who deserves much more attention than he has received um, in sort of standard histories of both American art and modern art, because as you can see, he's an artist who's experimenting with abstraction in a way that might have called to mind someone like Jackson Pollock or Helen Frankenthaler. Um, but he's also trying to maintain his identity as a landscape painter in a moment where landscape painting, you know, th this, you know, the 20th century, especially into the mid 20th century, um, was you know not the most fashionable you know medium uh, <laughs> you know to to practice. Um, so his relationship to O'Keeffe is interesting, um, and it's something that I I'm trying to trace more in my research because a few years after they met in Hawaii, Tam ends up going to New York City um, and basically living there for his mature career, splitting his time between there, Monhegan Island in Maine, and then making trips back to Hawaii and and elsewhere. Um, so it's entirely possible that he ran across O'Keefe again, um, and I would be fascinated to know whether, you know, there are re recorded instances of that. In this particular case, though, in their meeting in Hawaii, it's really fascinating. Um, in Tam's diary, of course, we only have, I've only read his impressions of the visit. I'd love to track down what she thought. So we have kind of a one-sided impression, but I will say that he really worried about whether she would understand him. Apparently, um, she was interested in meeting him because someone had told her about a painter who had looked at her work and had said, if she can paint bones for her entire life, then I can paint sand for my entire life. And this was attributed to, to Tam. So she was interested in, in seeking out this painter who could just, who was content to paint 
sand, um, so to speak. Um, so he was worried that she didn't understand him. Um, and then he records this back and forth where he tries to tell her something. And he's young in 1939. Um, you know, he's, um, he's like 20 years old. So he's trying to tell her something about like his work and what it means to him. And, and then he keeps recording in his diary. She responded with something about herself. So he felt, I think, in awe that this celebrity was visiting him, but he also felt like there was a kind of disconnect. And eventually they, over the course of the diary entry, we read how they found common ground. You know, he, he tried to talk to her about sort of how her perspective as a tourist was different from his as a native. And I think by the end, they sort of reached a sense of in agreement. You know, she she kind of left him with that challenge that, you know, maybe you'll be the one to finally see Hawaii properly, you know. And I wonder if he took that challenge, you know, forth. I think I think it informed, you know, um, I can't help but think of it as sort of informing his work. Um, but yeah, it's a fascinating intersection. I love, I mean, there's a, the sort of middle section of the talk is, was so fun for me because it is actually about all these interpersonal relationships among, among artists. And as an art historian, when you can trace that, it's, it just enlivens even more the connections you're trying to make among artworks. And I think that's a fascinating place to end tonight's discussion, lecture, program. Thank you again, Dr. Kamiya Shahi.